Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to the 2022 ACON seminar series. Um, it's 9 a.m. here in Colorado. Thanks for joining us today. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Shangri Kong. He is a senior researcher at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, where he got his PhD in chemistry uh, with a thesis, uh, Molecular Investigations of Atmospherically Relevant Interface Processes, Ice Formation and Water Accommodation on Ice and Organic Surfaces. He did this postdoc at the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland, where he worked on synchrotron based photoelectron spectroscopy. He's uh, an adjunct professor at Northwest University in Xi'an, China. Um, the main focus of his research has been on uh, the interaction at the surface of ice and aerosol particles. And today he's going to tell us about surface catalyzed redox reaction on inorganic aerosol surfaces when condensed water is solvating the surface. I want to remember uh, for the people following in streaming that you can enter your question in the space below. And at the end of the presentation, um, I will read those questions. Uh, and um, Shangri, please take it away. Hey, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, thanks for everyone uh, for coming, join this in the early time, in the morning time. I guess, uh, most of you. And today I want to talk about uh, this title, Understanding the Water on Surface Catalysis in the Context of Atmospheric Chemistry. So before I tell you what do I mean about water on surface ca catalysis, I want to put up uh, on this map. And this map shows our current, basically our current theory about our uh, most used theory for uh, aerosol science. And it, it have, this have different regimes. And if you look at the right-hand side, you see this is in equilibrium, which is under the thermodynamics uh, equilibrium. And under, underneath of that, we can see, we can uh, uh, parameterize the molecular interactions in our creative systems, and we can have activity models. From that models, we can describe well uh, about the uh, uh, partitioning between the gas phase and the condensed phase, for instance. And also, we can predict or describe the deliquence and the, the growth of uh, uh, droplets uh, of aerosols. And uh, in the middle uh, regime, I mean, not all the system is in equilibrium, but they can be in a quasi uh, in the, this meta stable uh, regime. That the system it can be super cooled or oversaturated, for instance, and the system is slowly, gradually approaching to the equilibrium. Then we need to consider about the condensation and the evaporation, uh, the net condensation and the net evaporation that the system is approaching to the equilibrium. Or there's a, a some, like, for instance, the, the nucleation uh, where, where there's an energy barrier that the system needs to overcome to crystallize things. And this same principle applies for the efflorescence. But here, this talk, I want to emphasize these interfacial processes and uh, features on the left hand side. And there's some uh, A, B, C, D, like four um, uh, 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 independent, independent or uh, topics about this regime. For instance, this ion selective surface propensity. This is means some, if you have a mixture of ions in your aqueous system, but on the surface, the proportion of different ions can be different compared to what you, what you have in the bulk. Uh, or in the B, the surface dissociation, dep uh, depression, and enhancement, which means if you, if you have something like a strong acid, strong base, absorb on surface of water or ice, that kind of surface. And those molecules can be, uh, the dissociation constant of that molecule can be different compared to what you measure in the bulk. So the surface acid, um, acidity or so is similar to the pH, but it's the uh, pH doesn't have a definition on the surface. Uh, the pH or the acidity, acidity of the surface could be different compared to what you may have in the bulk. And it, and in the bulk, this is what we usually describe by the thermodynamics. And uh, where we have the C predeliquence, and this is uh, at the RH, relatively humidity lower than the DRH, the deliquence RH. Uh, so even the RH is not as high as enough to trigger the deliquence, but uh, at that low RH, there's some, still some uh, the surface uh, level uh, water absorption happening on the surface of the substance. And this is uh, called the pre-deliquence. 
and also the D, which is on water catalysis, catalysis. And this is like a comparison of, of about about uh, the, the term that I'm going to talk about today, the water on. So it, I just switch the water on and on water, right? And the on water catalysis is means the, on the surface aqueous systems. There is some uh, chemistry has been absorbed or accelerated on top of the surface compared to the bulk. But here the E, the water on surface catalysis. catalysis. Uh, I'm not talking about a quiz phase or on, on ice. We are talking about on um, inorganic salt. And the surface catalysis is triggered by the absorbed water from the gas phase. So during, for instance, during this uh, pre-deliquence or deliquence process, this, this uh, catalysis uh, mechanism can be triggered on. So this is what I want to explain you today about. So um, it's not easy to probe the interfacial process and the surface uh, information. So we need some uh, very uh, quite uh, advanced techniques to do that. And here, uh, this is the technique I'm gonna show you today. So it's a synchrotron-based ambient pressure X-ray photon electron spectroscopy and APXPS in short. The principle is very easy. Uh, I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna show my uh, curve. I hope you can, oh, sorry. I hope you can see my mouse here. Um, okay, uh, the principle is very easy. So first we have the X-ray, uh, which is the source of, of our, of our X-ray, uh, the source of X-ray. And in a synchrotron, we can control uh, the photon energy of the X-ray. So we know what is coming in, right? And also in the our other station, we have a, a detector called the electron uh, kinetic energy detector. We can detect electron kinetic energy. And so we know if you look this figure here, we know the input energy and we know the output energy. And the difference of them is the bending energy of the item of the electrons in each item. And this bending energy can tell us a lot of things. Uh, for instance, for, okay, first, uh, first of all, this method is highly surface sensitive because electrons can only uh, doesn't have very short attenuation uh, lengths. It doesn't come from the deep or from the sample. You can only we can only see the electrons from the surface. And uh, from from the bending energy of uh, of the electrons, we can know what element is it. We can know, we also can know what's the oxidation state of the elements and whether or not it's dissociate and also different functional groups and also prot protonation states. And uh, by the same setup, if we mo monitor the principle a little bit, we don't measure the photon energy, uh, the photon electrons. We measure the OG electron. The OG electron is proportional to the absorption of X-ray. Then we can get this uh, Called the next class, which is uh, is short for this um, uh, near edge X ray absorption fine structure, and from that technique we can also uh, uh, figure uh, the uh, hydrogen bond network. So it's a very fine local environment of the sample. And uh, this is two examples that the two synchrotrons I am mainly working with. One is the Max four in Lund in Sweden and also uh, this Swiss light source, SRS, in the SPSI in Switzerland. And I want to show you, just very briefly show you about the background of this method. So briefly, the principle is the photoelectric effect that's described by Einstein. Um, so we have the uh, photon in and the uh, electrons out. And we are compared different of the energy different of these two quantity, right? And uh, for the, uh, for this method, there's another, another two uh, Nobel Prize winners on this technique. And uh, I call this uh, the fathers of XPS, but it's not only for the father of XPS, actually they are father and sons also. And they are all both contribute to the, to the, to the method. Uh, so yes, so what I want to say here, you can see this Nobel Prize is given in 1981. So it's, uh, it's quite a long time ago. So why we are talking about this method now, we are still call that uh, state of the art. And the reason for that is that we now introduce this um, uh, environmental chamber. Uh, 
Because this method is a very surface sensitive, um, and this can be very this signal, which is electrons, can be very easily attenuated by the gas phase. So this method has to be used in the uh, ultra high vacuum conditions, and uh, in this ultra high vacuum conditions, there's no gas phase. And but in our determination of aerosols, we do have to have this gas phase to allow this exchange between the condensed phase and the, the gas phase. So this method was not able to have the gas phase, so the system was not really directly relevant to aerosol science. But now we have this uh, environmental chamber, which allows that we have the local uh, high pressure around the sample. Uh, so that means we can have a study some atmospheric relevance system there. And the principle I can very quickly describe it is just a way how uh, we uh, minimize the, the distance that the electron needs to travel through this chamber. So we have these uh, different configurations. Yeah, but this is a very brief, that is, this is the idea. Uh, so before I go to the point of today's topic, I want to show you two examples that we have used this method before. And this was uh, one study we did, uh, was published in 2017, that we first time with, uh, discover or prove that uh, the HCl, this strong acid, can, can stay in a molecular form on top of ice. And just quickly show you the capacity of this method. So you can see on the sample holder here, if you see the background there, this is the surface of a sample holder. And you can see there are some ice-like crystals there, and they were uh, formed in situ on the top of the surface because we can change the temperature of the surface holder and also we can change the RH by introducing the vapor, uh, vapor into this environment chamber. And then we, and then we dose HCl on, on the ice. And this in short, you see these uh, different spectrums. This is show you, we detect different state, uh, dissociation states of the HCl. Some of them is dissociate, Cr minus, and some of them is not, it's HCl. And so we, and also one feature of this XPS is that we can do depth profile. So we can basically change the photon energy from the synchrotron source. And uh, the, then the uh, propping depths will be increasing proportional uh, to the photon energy. So by doing that, we can probe the uh, information from different depths. And uh, just in short, and if you, I, um, we put a three layer model and describe this, uh, this, this uh, depth profiles based on different ratios. And this figure a schematic view is what we got. So you can see we have different uh, ice structures and we have HCl absorbed, physical absorbed on the surface. And also we see that uh, the physical, uh, the molecular uh, HCl is only existing on the very top of the surface. It's below one nanometer. And below that is totally di dissociated. And the total dissociation is more or less what we expect from the, our thermodynamics understanding of HCl. And uh, yes, just one side note here is this is the next class that has have been described earlier. And this show the different uh, hydrogen bond network. Uh, for, from the hydrogen bond network, we can distinguish of the liquid water and the clean ice. And also we observe that uh, like this green one, the HCl on ice with high load. And this one actually um, disordered the surface, the structure surface of the ice. So this um, HCl is enhanced the disorder degree of the ice surface. So this is one example about the XPS can, we can, what, it, what we can do about that. And there's another uh, some uh, examples that we study uh, this time not on ice, this is on salt. So you see our path is transiting to the salt gradually. And from this one, I can show you very quickly here. We have found two things here. Uh, from the sodium and the oxygen spectrum here, we can detect that the predeliquence that I described in my first slide. We saw the, uh, the water absorption from the, from the oxygen uh, spectrum. The, the, uh, the water absorption already happened well below the DRH, the deliquent RH. And also uh, from the sodium one, we can see that surface is start to being uh, solvated. So it's not only absorption, physical absorption of water 
and the salt itself is also uh, uh, solvated be below the DRH. So this is nice uh, proof to this uh, hypothesis has been posed before. And yes, so yeah, so basically this is the path we are moving to the salt. But today's main topic, I want to show you this one very intriguing chemistry that we discussed, discovered on a, a very typical uh, inorganic salt, salt, which is ammonium sulfate. And this is a poster. I want to show you everything at once, but I will go to in, go into details in the next uh, in the rest of this uh, this talk. So let's continue. So why we study this ammonium sulfate? And this is the, I think this is a famous uh, map that we showed that we have a lot of sulfate uh, aerosols uh, in the atmosphere. And if you look at this uh, uh, summary about this global population weighted mean PM 2.5 uh, conversations, we see that the sulfate, which is the red one, is, is a, a big part of the total. And also the ammonia is, is also very, Significant, significant part. So that's why uh, this ammonia sulfate has been uh, studied widely uh, by the, our community. And this is uh, one of the reasons why I choose this system to, to begin with. And uh, yes, I will briefly show this one, but I guess uh, uh, you probably know this, uh, be familiar with this. And this is the radiative forcing that uh, from, published in 2014. And this is the, uh, the report published last year. And the one, one change, uh, I think very interesting is that the, this, uh, this negative uh, radiative forcing for the global cooling effect of, of sulfur dioxide, so SO2, had a really high, a large error bar. And that is part of that is coming from this SO2 to sulfate transition is not really well known. So where does this sulfate uh, component come from? It's a question. So certainty of modeling. And this is the, how the sulfate uh, uh, in fact, because it's the uh, increased albedo uh, by change the microphysics properties of clouds with without uh, sulfate. Okay, so this was uh, a lot of uh, uh, introduction of background, and, but let me show you what we de uh, exactly detect on top of this ammonia sulfate surface. So this is uh, the, uh, I show you these two spectrums. One is for the sulfur side and one is for the nitrogen side. And this is the two components that we have for this ammonia sulfate. And for this uh, sulfur one, it, because it's a 2p electron, it should have a doublet. So I just fit it with the doublet, but these two doublets come from the one species, which is sulfate. And for the nitrogen side, I didn't fit it because it's a 1s electron, it only have one peak. So this is only just one, uh, one species. So the interesting things happen when we increase the RH. So before it was 3% of RH, this figure shows. And then we have, now we have this RH equal to 48. By the way, the DRH, the deliquent RH of uh, ammonium sulfate is about around 78% uh, to 80% depending on the temperature. So th as this RH is still not deliquent, it's called, uh, it, you can consider that it's pre-deliquent. There's some uh, water absorbed on the surface, but the phase is not totally changed. But already, already at this point, we can see that from the sulfur uh, side, there are some additional peaks there. And you can see it's a, now it's already fitted, it's uh, assigned to elemental sulfur, this S0, and also this bisulfate. So this, this sulfur is have this minus two oxygen states. And by comparison before it was plus six, right? And from the uh, nitrogen side, you can see there are some even more peaks here. And first of all, you have, we have this ammonia, ammonium uh, peak. And on the right-hand side, we have this ammonia, which is a deprotonated ammonia. 
which we do expect it when we have some water, because we know that uh, ammonia like to give away the proton when in the aqueous phase. So this peak is more or less what we expected already before this experiment. Uh, but before that, uh, but uh, besides that, we also have this Horner peak, uh, which is here, which is, this is totally unexpected. And also this uh, reduced sulfur is totally unexpected. So there's some mystery here. And then I can show you even more is that we, in the experiment, we continue to increase the RH. So now it's 78% of the RH, and this is the deliquence RH. And then because we know, we see that the system is uh, taking up water and being dissolving, it's ongoing. And you can see uh, in this uh, a bracket here there is transition, a transient, which means the system is not stable yet. It's in this uh, matter stable. Uh, so the water, uh, so water is being absorbed on the surface, and the system is being um, moving towards to the aqueous uh, aqueous phase. But still, now it's uh, like a slush uh, slush uh, phase. It's a mixture. But very interesting is that we see these very tough uh, doublets here, which can be easily fit by this elemental sulfur. So at this point, the old sulfur is basically this elemental sulfur. And from, for the nitrogen side, it's even more mystery because during the experiment, we didn't see any signal from the nitrogen. And at the beginning, we thought we are, we are watching at different wrong and uh, mistakenly at different uh, energy. So we spent some time to look for this nitrogen species. Uh, but in the end, we have to take a really long uh, width of the different electrons. And we confirm that at that point, there's no nitrogen species. So the nitrogen species is totally gone. But this, system, this uh, phenomenon doesn't last long because when the, all this uh, undissolved salt being dissolved, which means the system became a solution. And because this is a D, uh, the, uh, the, the RH is a DRH, so the system is a, is a saturated solution. And then we measure the system again, which is a, a solution uh, status. Okay? And we see that, oops, sorry. Uh, we see that uh, for this sulfur uh, side, this uh, sulfate, it's showing up again, and based on trace level of this reduced, but it's quite uh, uh, basically immersed in the, in the noise level here. So the system is going back to what we actually expected from the beginning. And uh, if we see the, uh, the other part, uh, the, nitri uh, the nitrogen part, so there's ammonia coming back, and ammonia coming, uh, there's uh, ammonia and ammonia coming back. And also a little bit hono, but it's uh, yeah, this is but it's very low level. So yes, I'm gonna show you this uh, this time series about between the uh, this transient and the steady uh, status uh, in the in this uh, right hand side. So this is you can see from the T zero when we have when we increase the arch to seventy eight percent, and then we wait for five minutes, sixteen minutes. 47 minutes and 59 minutes. You can see from the nitrogen side, this was nothing at the beginning, but it's recovering slowly. And for the sulfur side, it's totally dominating by the reduced sulfur, but then it's shifting back to this uh, ammonia, uh, ammonia uh, sulfur, uh, uh, not ammonia, sorry, sul sulfate, sulfate sulfur gradually. So yeah, so this is, um, what we discovered. And uh, just show you this slide is that the reason why we assigned these uh, different peaks with different species is that we collaborate with the uh, theoreticians and we calculate the, the binding energy, the, the relative binding energy of different species. And that's why we got these, these different uh, species. Of course, we also need to com uh, compare with literatures, but we didn't use a single method. We compared literatures and also we rely on our um, calculations. Right. So um, we have all the species. And then the problem, the question is that how we fit it into our in one theory, in the mechanism. 
And I'm going to show you this one. This one is, uh, we were lucky because uh, this mechanism that is what we found in the last day of the experiment. And we found this mechanism was, first of all, was proposed like 20 years ago. And all the, what we monitor the species are all included in this species, in, in this mechanism. So yeah, we were quite very excited. And we thought this, yeah, very likely there was something to do with this mechanism. And this mechanism is called the sulfate reducing ammonia oxidation. Actually, this has been widely used in this uh, with the water treatment industry. And you can see this uh, overall re reactions here. And from the GP energy, you can see it's negative, which it, it means uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's favored by thermodynamics. However, by heart, we know that this cannot be spontaneous, right? Otherwise, this all the sulfate and ammonia will spontaneously react and form uh, aluminum sulfur and nitrogen gas and water. But we know it's not happening in, the, in, in nature. Otherwise, we, don't, we won't have these two components in, uh, in our aerosol uh, everywhere in the world. And the reason is that uh, if you decompose the reactions into some more detailed levels of uh, reactions, you can see the first one here is, uh, this is have a very high positive uh, GPS energy, which, which means this step is not spontaneous. And in this industry, industry side, they have to use some biocatalysis like bacteria to trigger, to help with this uh, first uh, reaction. And if they can trigger, uh, overcome the, the barrier for this one, then the next one it will, be, will be easy. So this is what has been proposed mechanism by this paper. And, uh, but this mechanism has never been proved by, uh, uh, by, by experiment. But nevertheless, in industry, in this, with the water treatment, people have been using it for a long time. So this is really established uh, uh, mechanism, this strong mechanism. But in our case, in our case, we don't have this catalysis of bacteria. Uh, we only have this surface, and we know that something happens when we increase the RH. So uh, this is our um, this is our mechanism here. Uh, if you compare the one before, it's basically exactly the same, except for this uh, sulfide and this nitride. They are protonated. This is what we. This is what we detected from our calculation, from the uh, up initial MD calculation. And, but otherwise, everything is the very similar. And that means uh, on the surface environment, this process is somehow uh, catalyzed uh, by this uh, surface salvation uh, process. As for why is surface salvation, I will show you uh, later in yeah, another independent test. Uh, this process is happening when the water absorbed on the surface and the surface is being solvated. And then somehow this uh, mechanism is triggered, can, go, uh, can, can happen spontaneously. And by the way, I want to uh, admit that this is the most elemental step we can have from the, from the, from the, from the paper. But this is uh, how seven different components involved. So this have give uh, the theoreticians a lot of um, problems to calculate the energy profiles of water reaction. So we didn't do that. Uh, but I think we need to uh, continue to study this uh, mechanism and maybe uh, there should be more elemental uh, steps, elementary steps of the reactions. But now this is the most basic steps that we can have right now. Okay, so this is um, this is uh, the overview about the mechanism that I have showed before. So I can go through it so we can have a big picture about the, the whole system. So at the beginning, we have this uh, dry samples, ammonium sulfate at RH3%, and everything is uh, in a uh, solid phase. And then we increase the RH to 48. The so surface starts to absorb some water. And also we have this pre deliquent surface, the surface, the ions can be released by uh, contacting with water. 
And then this C and D panels shows the mechanism that I have shown earlier. This is like a straw-like mechanism. This, uh, these two components react to form some intermediate oxidase states of the different species. And this species can further react with to the, to the end product, which is elemental sulfur and also nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen, nitrogen gas, nitri or yeah, N2. But because N2 is so volatile, it doesn't really like to be in the condensed phase. But this can be easily go to the gas phase. So this is 48% of the RH. And we uh, further increase the RH to 40, uh, 78%. And this is during this transient phase. Everything is going on. Uh, because we have a lot of water and all the, all the components have uh, increased the diffusion capacity in this more fluid system. And just everything goes quite fast, more fast, faster compared to before. And just another fact is that because the, one of the end products, the nitrogen, is so volatile, so it's, complete, it's, so it's, it's uh, continuously depleted from the condensed phase, which is goes to the gas phase. And the depletion of the product will further accelerate these uh, reactions. So these reactions goes really fast when you have this uh, transient uh, uh, phase. So it's so fast so that the, uh, the, the all the nitrogen species is gone because all the nitrogen species is uh, an, an N2, also the gas phase, we don't detect from the surface. And what we detect on the surface is actually only the elemental sulfur that we see a really sharp doublet there. And uh, at that point, it's uh, like a pure water plus some elemental sulfur and nothing else that we see. But we know that this is not stable, right? Because they, we have only 78% of the RH and the pure water is not stable under, under these conditions. So what's happening is that the, the salt is keeping dissolving and uh, uh, this water keeps dis dissolving the, the salt. So the, the, the concentration of this ammonia and the sulfate is continue, continuously increasing. And, and the, in the end, we reach uh, the stable, sta uh, st stable states of the system, which is the saturated solution about the salt. Um, yes, so I mean, typically, if one only look at the uh, equilibrium, uh, equilibrium system, one might look only at this A and this H, but just doing this uh, transient or this, uh, quasi, uh, this uh, pre deliquence states, we see there's actually something else happening. And that might be overlooked in our previous investigations. So this could indicate something yeah, happening during this, uh, yeah, this uh, transition period. So and, um, I think this is quite good, but uh, during the experiment, this was, this, because this discovery was so weird, we cannot believe that. So we have to try to understand it uh, to have this, uh, like uh, have our philosophy to, uh, to be uh, not too far away from what we, or what we discovered. So this is another perspective that we consider these reactions. I'm going to show you here. So this uh, show you this uh, sulfur. Sulfur have very quite flexible uh, possibilities of oxygen states, and this is all the oxygen states that sulfur can have. And uh, we are looking at the most oxidized uh, sulfur species, one of the most. And for the nitrogen, nitrogen is even more flexible. And here we are looking at this uh, most reduced species. So you have you see this is potential here, but it doesn't mean much because we know it's uh, it should be very stable. And then we have to think about lead change, uh, be slightly flexible in our thinking. Then we are talking about this. Uh, we just uh, there was a transition uh, was the animation that. Uh, uh, we consider instead of the sulfur sulfate, we consider we try to think of the nitrate instead. So what happens for this ammonia nitrate? Ammonia nitrate is widely used uh, fertilizer, but it's uh, not it should be stable. But I think we know that this ammonia nitrate is not that stable. 
This is the picture uh, for two years ago. That was the uh, explosion in Lipanon. This was the explosion of this uh, ammonia, so, uh, ammonia nitrate. So we know that uh, when you have this most reduced and most oxidized, and maybe they have uh, some certain uh, energy barrier to overcome. But uh, if you can overcome that, they can, they can react very fast. And just a little bit more words about this, this reaction, this ammonia nitrate. Uh, if you see the textbook, ideally, the final products of this reaction is uh, uh, nitrogen gas and also N2O. But from the picture that uh, I think as an atmospheric scientist, we can easily say there must be some uh, N2, uh, NO2 form there from the, this uh, brown, uh, red brownish color. And I'm not sure if you want can put some in instruments there. Maybe there are some other species can be detected, not from the color, but if they need some more uh, instrument. So maybe there are some more uh, uh, oxygen state species uh, formed during these reactions. Now let's go back to the to the to the sulfur side. So it's the most uh, oxidized sulfur, and I put up this uh, reactions. Uh, this mechanism reactions here. So we have these two reactions, uh, reactants, uh, ammonia and sulfate. And actually, what we did discovered is that the other species is could be uh, products of this uh, redox uh, reactions between this uh, most reduced the nitrogen and the most oxidized sulfur. So this this is. This is not direct evidence, but it is somehow help us help us to understand. Okay, these reactions might be happening. Um, right, and uh, this is uh, uh, just show you once. This is a very busy slide. I don't want to explain everything here. And this is show you one capacity of STS that we can detect different depth profiles, and uh, maybe only one panel here shows. Uh, the depth profile of the reduced sulfur versus the sulfate sulfur. And this axis show you the depth profile, which is now is in terms of the kinetic energy. But here, the higher the kinetic energy, the deeper of the uh, signal can come, can come out. So, uh, so here, trying simply shows that this, this reduced sulfur, this weird sulfur, is a, is a really surface enhanced is mainly on the top of the surface. If you probe in the deep, this species can become less. So uh, this shows that this um, uh, reactions is uh, likely to happening on a surface, on, a, on the topmost surface. Right. Um, I, um, another very important uh, proof for this mechanism is that um, for any system that we studied with X-ray, we always worry about this is from beam damage, radiation damage, or artifact from the, from the X-ray, because the X-ray is very powerful. So actually in this study, we spent um, most of the time to figure out, to exclude this is not, cannot be radiation damage. I will briefly uh, go through this. This is quite technical, but in the end, I will show you the most convincing uh, uh, evidence that at least, at least for me to, uh, to show this is, cannot be a beam damage. But let me go through uh, quickly what we did. So um, for example, here is uh, we, we checked, uh, we just measure at, um, at pre deliquence uh, point, for example, 48% of RH, everything was stable. Then we just monitor, we just measure for a long time, like uh, 11.5 hours before and after some other measurements. And we see this feature is not changing at a pre, -delinqu at pre -delinquent point. Uh, normally, if we have beam damage, the beam, da beam induced species will grow under the beam. But this is not the case. It's quite stable if you have uh, the arch at the uh, arch at the pre deliquence range. And then also we try another thought uh, at, uh, uh, for this uh, ammonia sulfate, at, uh, even at 15 RH, we see a small peak here. This is reduced sulfur. But when we change another thought, like a, a sodium sulfate, 
we see this really uh, sharp, quite sharp uh, doublet for sulfate at, and at all different RH until the deliquence. We never see uh, this uh, reduced species. So which means the sulfate is quite very stable under the beam. So this must be something about this ammonia and the sulfate. And also, uh, we also uh, test uh, the RH dependence. Uh, or, or we also try the temperature dependence because we can change the RH by either changing the temperature or uh, the pressure. And we tried both. And uh, we rule out uh, a couple of possibilities. This cannot be due to the temperature as well. It's, it's related to the RH. And uh, this is, Quite interesting. It's because we saw this. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, you, now you see there's nothing on this side, and this is when we decrease the RH. So during this uh, during this procedure, the system became uh, effluent, crystallized again. So this phenomenon is not happening when we have this transition from liquid from solution to solid, but it's only uh, happening from the solid taking up water to solution. So that's why we say that this, this process is, is really depending on the sulfate solvation process. But uh, off above is, is, is uh, making sense. It um, shows um, increase our confidence about this cannot be a beam, uh, this might not be a beam damage. But here is what we, uh, the very solid um, proof that it cannot be a uh, beam damage. So this is an illustration that our uh, measurements. So typically we have this uh, X3 shining on the surface on a spot. This, this is the spot we are looking at. And then we have this uh, water on, which is by increasing the RH. Then we see this uh, odd peak, this reduced uh, sulfate happening at this point at T0. But at this point, we cannot rule out is that uh, this species formed when we have the water and the X3. At this point, we have two components. So maybe this is the beam damage that only, I mean, it requires the water to be, to be present as well. So we cannot say uh, this is only on, uh, up to the water because the X3 is always, always, is always there can do something as well. So what we have, the data we have, is actually we have another spot, which is never been exposed to the X-ray, which is a fresh one. And then we increase the, um, uh, the RH, like we increase the RT in the whole chamber, so all the surface has been exposed to the high RH. And then we travel the beam, uh, travel the beam to this spot, and then we monitor here, and then we see, okay, we have something uh, some uh, odd peak, but apparently they are they cannot be T zero. They cannot be the uh, they cannot be this uh, uh, this only elemental sulfur, because here we know this is a combination of different two species. This is uh, which means that something is happening already before, and then we travel back and forth. We have like here illustrate three windows like here here. It's keeping going down. Relax, and then we can fit compare with the uh, other, other spot we have been absorbed. And we see, okay, this behavior actually fit very well uh, compared to the one we have be looking at. So we know that this T0 is actually happening well before we look at it first time. So this proves that our, this uh, mechanistry is happening independent of the X-ray. This rule out the possibilities of the beam damage. So this is our evidence, technically evidence. This is real chemistry. Okay. So um, this I have been talking about um, uh, this uh, very very interesting chemistry. That's what's new. And what we are looking at now is that we are looking at uh, is this re is this chemistry really happening uh, in the in the, in nature. So one of the uh, project we are doing now is we study the brines from Salt Lake, from uh, this uh, from this uh, Chardam Basin in uh, Tibet Plateau, and 
we found uh, some uh, interesting uh, surface sensitive uh, hygroscopic hygroscopic be behaviors. We have a paper published there. Uh, but next step, we are we will uh, increase the RH to 80% because we know we we thought from our evidence also have another uh, collaborative uh, independent studies which show which shows that even in this uh, comp complex system, when you increase the RH to a certain point, the surface can have some quite weird redox chemistry. Uh, yeah. So the next step we will study. The same, we use the same principle, the same technology, and but instead of instead of looking at this ammonia sulfate pure salt, we will look at this nature substance. And uh, here is this um, one example that our ongoing studies, and we see that some unexpected ion ion selective surface depletion on this Martian salt analog upon surface solvation. By the way. Uh, this uh, Chatham basin has been considered as one Martian analog. So the, this uh, brines of the salt can maybe have some indication of the environment on Mars that we, yeah, this are illustrated by this uh, cover art of our study. And to be this is uh, some ongoing uh, uh, result. We're gonna submit this one hopefully this week and and being short, we just uh, see some um, we see some unexpected some uh, some um, to be uh, to be detailed is um, uh, this uh, ratio of the magnesium and uh, uh, no not magnesium is this um, uh, chloride and uh, sulfur spe uh, uh, species. And when we have we compare the dry samples and also have the samples at four percent of RH, we see that uh, there is a big change of the of this elemental ratio, which we didn't expect it. Then we have to re rely on theoretician uh, simulation to explain this. But this is an ongoing uh, work that we are using the same technique and uh, we are keep exploring. And this is another uh, thing we are looking at now. Uh, uh, from, the, from the new chemistry from the surface, we know that this uh, sulfate and sulfur and the nitrogen can do something different. Uh, but in that system, this sulfate, sulfur and the nitrogen, they are both in the condensed phase. Then the question is that, what if you put another species, one element from the gas phase? For instance, this uh, SO2. You, you introduce sulfur from the gas phase, and this sulfur can uh, be take uptake on the surface, and well, that triggers on this new chemistry as well. And this have a lot of motivations, uh, like the upper uh, figure shows that uh, you have a lot of sea salt, uh, 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 especially on the ocean. And by the way, this is uh, uh, this this ongoing uh, project is uh, we study this SO2 on uh, chloride uh, salts. So we motivate it with uh, sea salt globally. And also this, the, the lower map is showing this SO2 uh, map of the globe. Uh, so the SO2 is very, as you can see, uh, this uh, IPCC report, SO2 is very important and very uncertain uh, with our understanding. But also it, it's both from anthropogenic sources and also from this map, this particular map is uh, taken from last year. And this uh, Grand Canary Islands, they have a volcano erupting at, by then. So SO2 is not only from aspartanic, but also from natural sources. So this is our another project. And here we want to just to, to, uh, to uh, contribute our understandings of SO2 to uh, this uh, sulfate species. I want to study this the surface chemistry, whether or not contribute to this tra transition. Yes. So by now I want to uh, say my thanks to all my partners, all my collaborators from Grossenberg and also from PSI and also our theoreticians, Ivan, and also uh, the partners, uh, Ruth, that are on our this uh, nature substance project. And also thanks to the 
sponsors of this project. So yes, so this is all my talk. Um, I would really want to stress this uh, quote from uh, Pauli. Gold made the bulk, surface were invented by the devil. So apparently surface can do something strange. From this, what we studied recently is, I think, yeah, I cannot agree more about this, uh, this, this quote. A surface might do something really weird that need to be further uh, investigated. Yes, I think that's all my talk. Yeah, thank you so much um, for the very interesting talk. And I totally agree with Polly that um, that's, that's why your, your work caught my attention because, um, you know, it's, uh, it's very common to, um, to neglect the surfaces because they're hard. <laughs> and then um, and everything, uh, everything is yeah. homogeneously distributed inside because that makes our life easier. So I really appreciate that uh, somebody is taking <laughs> is taking some um, some time and some efforts to to investigate what's what's going on. Um, let's see if we if we get some uh, some questions from from Slido. In the meantime, I have a, a curiosity about your uh, some details of, of your environmental chamber. Um, uh, at the at the synchrotron. Um, mm. So, were you studying um, re aerosols suspended, or it was a it it was a deposition? Because it wasn't very clear to me during your talk. Ah, yes. I, for this study, we use a surface holder, so it's a deposit on the surface. Um, but in synchrotrons, you always you also have this aerosol train uh, apparatus uh, from depending in, I know in France, in Soleil, they have that, and also in other uh, synchrotrons. But in this study, we have this surface deposited. Yeah, so in uh, following up to this, then uh, would you expect a size dependency of this, of this effect? And, and, you know, what, what do you expect if you go very small, very big? I guess very big is, closer to what you did. Mm, but then yeah. if you start to go super small, then even weirder stuff will start to happen. Yeah, right? uh, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, I got these questions from time to time. and But of course, I don't have the evidence to show you. But I do uh, expect that if you have uh, very small nanoparticles, then maybe, yeah, this redox uh, reactions could be even more weird, um, but we do expect, uh, we do plan to do that because we have this um, chamber experiment we will do uh, in September in Paris. Uh, we will study this uh, dependence of the size as well. Uh, but of course, then we will measure the gas phase. We won't measure the, uh, the surface anymore. Of course, then we will, there are more uncertainties because we don't really know what the surface uh, production is. So yeah, but I agree with you. The size is very important um, parameter, but, but I don't know the answer. Okay, um, Justin uh, is saying great talk. All the cool stuff happens at the edge of boundaries. So just a comment that he enjoyed. Uh, he enjoyed the talk. Um, yeah, it doesn't. Let, let's let's wait a couple of more minutes to see if we have. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have if we have more questions and um, yeah, in the meantime, so so in this transition regime, um, aerosols could become sources of of gas phase. Uh, oh no, uh, do I understand mm -hmm. that correctly? Uh, yeah, possibly. Um, yes, this is one of the aim we will do in September. Uh, but one uncertainty is that we detect the HONO on the surface, and we know that HONO is not the end product. Uh, the nitrogen is not end product. And one thing we know that nitrogen is completely depleted from the surface. There must be some uh, species of nitrogen containing 
escape to the gas phase. There must be some uh, gas phase nitrogen form. But we don't know what's the ratio of Hono and uh, nitrogen. So this is one uncertainty. Okay. And uh, oh. yes, and the because nitrogen is so hard, quite hard, challenging to detect. So we are trying to think a way to have this uh, uh, nitrogen gas free uh, environment and we can quantify the production of nitrogen gas versus HONO at the same time. So we can have this mass balance to see where this nitrogen species going. Very good. Well, I don't see any more, any more questions from Slido. So I'll, uh, I'll thank you uh, once more. Thanks again for the really cool science and the great talk. And I wanna thank everybody for, uh, for uh, having followed the, the seminar this early in the morning and see you next time. Bye-bye.